The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. All right. We're here with another rainy, rainy uh, evening in the Berg as we uh, start uh, tonight's Duke's Court. Uh, I'll be joining uh, Gary Deliverance Ken, uh, Chris uh, Hooper Fletcher, and myself, Dave the Bandit Finoli. Uh, sad week, uh, gentlemen, with uh, the death of uh, uh, America's top stud muffin, uh, Burt Reynolds. And, you know, and, uh, I, I, Fletcher, I you've had many, uh, many Ned Beatty uh, nightmares uh, because of Burt. Oh, uh, I did, I did. But he did have a pretty mouth. But uh, <laughs> I, I'm a little disappointed you didn't call me Evening Shade. I think that would have been... Uh, that would have been uh, where I was going with that, but <laughs> uh, it was too gentle. It was a too gentle a movie. Oh, I don't know that we want to celebrate uh, his life uh, uh, in such a, uh, a wholesome way. Well, there you go. Uh, yeah, we all got to learn to grit our teeth like that when we're being interviewed, or maybe on these podcasts. You know, <laughs> I know. You're, you're saying we we all need a little a uh, little more evening shade inside us, Gary. I, I think so, maybe. Maybe so. Uh, uh, well, I, I know you've always been fascinated by Mary Lou Henner, so I hope that's not the reason for your evening shade uh, b- fascination. <laughs> I have been fascinated by her. That's true. So. Oh man! It's a good memory, I, I'm embarrassed to admit that is part of my DVD collection downstairs. I will admit it here for the first time in my life over the comfortably zoned radio uh, airwaves. <laughs> Well, there are uh, encounter groups that we can we can get you into, and uh, you know we can we can get to the root of all of this, and we can all uh, feel that we've helped you, Dave. Uh, that's what it's all about. That's what uh, having a little evening shade inside each of us uh, will uh, will mark here. But uh, now that we've we've gotten the pleasantries out of the way, it's going to be a bitter night. I I have a feeling, gentlemen. Oh. Um, you know it. it Coming into this uh, Pitt-Penn State game last night, I didn't know what to expect. I knew Penn State certainly didn't look good defensively again against Appalachian State, giving up 28 points uh, in the fourth quarter of that contest. And you weren't quite sure what you had with Pitt. Uh, he, uh, Pat Narduzzi never uh, shows anything in those first games against Division uh, uh well, I guess we'll call them F, uh, FCS teams. I, I, I shouldn't call them Division One AA at this point, right. but um, the FCS. But you had to come out and think, you know, this guy, he coached magnificently against Virginia Tech in the next to last game of the season, um, incredibly against Miami, upsetting the number two team in the country. And he had to know Penn State turning down opportunities to – um, extend the series against Pitt. This was his opportunity on national TV in the prime game, the first prime game uh, for ages for, for the Pitt-Penn State game. In the 70s, it was always uh, one of the key games on ABC. But this was an opportunity to show what a good coach he was, where he's brought this team along. And then there was the coin flip. The coin flip where he directly told his guys, supposedly, if you win this flip, you give the, the give the kickoff to them, defer the kickoff. Pitt takes the kickoff in the heavy wind, in the heavy rain, and um, was the first of one of the ugliest, most undisciplined halves of football you'd ever want to see from a team. Um, just one dumb play after another. But yet, it was only seven to six. Penn State scoring on um, uh, early in the game, but the defense looked good. They were holding them down. It was seven six. Um, the punter had uh, um, it was a holder. Dropped the uh, the extra point. Dropped the field goal. Even with that, you had the feeling Pitt was out playing them. I was pumped. I was excited. Um, they're driving to go into the lead. They just tried twice up the middle to no avail at the four yard line. Field goal time, gentlemen? No. I had my, I had my special teams coming out. I know, I know, but he doesn't decide. He doesn't trust the uh, the, the kicker or the 
his holder from the four-yard line. So you're thinking, and I know you're thinking, uh, Gary, at this point, you're going to go for a play action and, and uh, roll around. Fletch, I know that's what you were thinking. Well, particularly uh, since the, the, the one thing that seemed to work well was Pickett when he would have to deal with a broken play. I mean, yeah. you, you think that that's the one thing that seemed to be giving Penn State quite a bit of problems. But continue on, Dave. Yep. It was. It was. Yep. But let's let's instead run up the middle a third consecutive time from the four-yard line, needing three yards for a first down, turning the ball over. And even with that, Penn State, uh, uh, after a uh, botch, pet, uh, botch punt, Penn State uh, scores again. But it's just 14-6. to six. You had a good feeling. Uh, um, Penn State, or Pitt had run for over 200 yards. By the way, they finished the game with under 200 yards uh, rushing. And um, just hoped that Narduzzi was going to make the right adjustments at halftime. Did he? Did he, gentlemen, I ask you? No. No, he did not. Um, adjustments backwards. Uh, yeah, adjustments backwards. Penn State backwards. decides to stack the line, figuring, well, they're not going to pass against us, apparently. So... The uh, predictable Penn State or Pitt uh, offense decides, eh, okay, you're stacking the line. We have a top par offensive line, but let's keep trying to go up the middle against you. And it just turned into one catastrophe after another. It was an embarrassment. It was one of the worst coached games I saw, one of the most undisciplined games I've seen. No adjustments were made. Um, Pitt's not a power football team. They don't have a power offensive line. I don't know why you're trying to tailor the offense to be a power offense in that situation. The defense looked good, but just gave up in the second half. I don't blame them. In a rainy, cold day where, where you don't have any um, uh, confidence in your coaching, the special teams were just an abomination, one stupid penalty after another. People are complaining. Franklin puts in the second team and keeps passing. So what? You, you don't want them to do that. Stop them. They bitched because he challenged a, 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 a play um, uh, late in the game with his team ahead by uh, 45 points. So what? What are you bitching about? Is, is there any uh, consolation with a 45-6 to six victory instead? James Franklin is a dick, no doubt. But you know what? Pitt deserved uh, to be embarrassed at that point. I, I, I've been a Narduzzi fan, but quite frankly – this next game, to me, is going to determine whether he sticks around next year because Heather Like is an AD, and I mean this in the utmost confidence because we've needed an AD like this at the school in ages, but she's like a piranha when people are screwing up. She's not going to put up with it. And so far she's shown a, an ability to find top-notch coaches for her other sports um, and pull out amazing hires when nobody gave her credit. If this guy blows the game against Georgia Tech, then he follows up with uh, um, Central Florida and, and Notre Dame, two games he's going to be um, highly um, uh, uh, high underdogs for, you have a potential to go to one and four, and it's going to be tough to rebound at that point. I, I'm, I'm just as disgusted with this team as I think I've ever been. I, 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 just, um, I, I just don't know... Uh, uh, don't know if, if this man is going to be able to pull this around. I, I, I know you had to be uh, – uh, you were watching it uh, um, pretty well there, uh, uh, Gary. Uh, yep. What were your thoughts about? Well, I mean, I would, I would pretty much mirror everything you said. I mean, I think it, it's interesting. Um, in the first uh, – probably about the first 20 minutes of the game, even though – you're probably right. You know, looking at that pit offensive line, a couple of them look like tight ends or receivers as opposed to offensive linemen. Yeah. But um, you know, they were they you know for whatever reason you know whether it was some misdirection or it was concerned about the legs of Pickett, you know they they were doing okay. I mean they you know they kind of made Penn State's run defense in particular look pretty pretty poor. You know through the, a lot of the first quarter and even a little bit into the second quarter. Now. The one thing that jumped out at me a little bit to add to what you said was, you know, Pickett looked to me a little bit inexperienced, though. Like, you know, and I'm not saying I, – I think, you know, Narduzzi clearly, hopefully uh, in the press conference, a lot of the questions that you're raising were asked. 
I, I didn't see that. But I think the thing that – it seemed like Pickett kind of pulled the trigger too quickly on getting out of the pocket and trying to run all the time. You know, I don't know. I guess he had, what, a couple good games at the latter part of last year, and he was, he was the starting quarterback in a couple of those big wins at the end of the season you referred to. But he doesn't have a ton of experience at this level yet is what yeah. I had interpreted from what I was hearing or listening to. He had. Those were his only two, only two games. Except right. He did season. seem to, whenever the pressure kind of, when the pocket started to collapse around a little bit, he, he quickly pulled the trigger, you know, and started running a little bit too early. So, I mean, that might have hurt the passing end to begin with. But to never go back to it when you fell down 14 to 6, and, and I don't know. I mean, this, this is the kind of stuff like, you know, what is this, 1906? I kept thinking, yeah. like, you know, just because the terrain is a little – I didn't think that field looked as bad as it does sometimes at other points in its history. I thought it actually looked a little bit better, you know, terrain than it had some other times when there's been heavy rain there or just, you know, get beat up by both, you know, the pro game and the college games. But, you know, when they fell down 14 to 6 and the tide had changed against them a little bit, the field position really wasn't that bad. They could try to put the ball in the air a little bit. You know, that was, that was completely unbelievable for, for me to try to figure out exactly what are they, what are they thinking here. You know, like, I, I mean, I, although I thought Pickett pulled the trigger on trying to run a little bit and get out of the pocket a little bit too quickly and didn't let any passing plays develop at times in the first half, you know, Allison, I thought, had a pretty good game. I mean, he yeah. rushed for what? He rushed for over 100 yards, I believe, 115 yards or so. So, he, he I mean, go ahead. Yeah, I, mean, I was just going to say, he, he did. It was 98 were in the first half. Um, right. So, I mean, they didn't do anything in the yeah. second half. But when they fell down and the momentum changed, it was really hard to figure out why they didn't try to put the ball in the air, even in a safe path. I mean, it's, it's got to be as difficult to run in a, in a pouring, driving rain, soggy, marshy field like Hines is, as it is to pass the ball in a short, quick passing game. But they, they tried none of that, which I could not figure out at all. And I don't think Penn State's, de- Penn State's defense the week prior pretty much watched a lot of that game from start to finish. Yeah. Appalachian State exposed a lot of things. I mean, you know, they exposed a lot of things on the outside for Penn State and the, and the corners and on plays mm-hmm. down the field and, and on special teams as well. And, and Pitt seemed to capitalize on none of those. I mean, and, you know, I don't know, in major college football, you got to have a coaching staff and you got to have players that shouldn't get to fl- – I mean, the play calling was completely ridiculous. I mean, when the game was 7-6, to six, you're in it. Penn State's got a choppy offense going. They're not, you know, McSorley wasn't performing that well. The, the running back whose name's escaping me now who had to end up having a big game really hadn't done that much Anderson. in the first half. You get the chance there to, you know, maybe going at the half up 9-7 to seven or so. You know, even after a couple of the, the ridiculous penalties and, and, and the, you know, the mishandled extra point. I mean, I, I just couldn't figure out what the hell are you thinking here? When if you take those three points, you end up going in maybe with a lead. I think it means a little bit, you right. know. And and honestly, that play calling made no sense. And then don't forget the don't forget the punt, Dave. I mean, I could have ran that punt back. I no, mean, yeah. nobody on that side of the field, which pretty much broke the game complete. The game was probably gone by then anyway. But on that punt, you're right. It looked like they totally quit. So I mean, I hate to say it, that kind of falls on the coaching staff a little bit too. Sure. And I know these are kids, not pros, but by the same token, I mean. You got you got you got to keep fighting a little harder than that, just because you're down whatever it was at the time, twenty four to six or whatever the number was at that time. I, I think you got to I think you got to fight a little bit harder than that. So it's a shame because you're right. Pitt finally got a chance here uh, to really do something, even if it would have been a glorious loss, like they say in boxing. Yeah, uh, they got a chance, and they end up getting crushed by honestly a Penn State team to me. I haven't watched, you know, since we're, I know we're going to talk about this, and, you know, it's, it's a Pittsburgh-oriented show, so football's a big game. They're watching a lot more of it, both pro and college. I mean, Penn State, to me, looks like one of the top three overrated teams in the country, honestly. And yet they, came in, and blitzed you. they came in and blitzed you 51-6. 51-6. to six. Yeah. 51 to six. So, I mean, that's not a good sign. Now, I, I, I think those games you mentioned, Dave, even mm-hmm. Central Florida, are winnable. But you better come out with a better game plan than that. And, honestly, I think you better have a – a little bit better focus from the last guy on the roster to the coaching staff when adversity hits you because it's gonna. You know, I mean, right. I think Notre Dame and Notre Dame is pretty is pretty overrated too. It certainly showed that on Saturday. Uh, I thought they looked a little bit average against Michigan too. They got a couple big plays in that game to kind of keep the game competitive. I'm like, sure there was cheating going on in the Michigan game, but go ahead. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, whenever Notre Dame things don't go well for Notre Dame, we know they always have an excuse. We know that. So. 
But um, my point is, though, that them and Penn State, to me, look like they're not teams that are really going to go that deep. Uh, you know, and I, and I think they both have some pretty serious flaws. But the, 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 the momentum change by the bad call, I thought, on that, uh, you know, third and three, and why you wouldn't try to take the points there with a 20-yard yeah. field goal is yeah, beyond Yeah, I agree. I mean, it just made absolutely no sense to me. And then, as Dave, as you and I communicate a little bit, I mean, when you fell down 14-6 to six and it's clear that the tide was changing against you, I mean, use this kid's legs. It's one thing that Pickett Skilly can move a little bit. Right. And I don't know. It's hard to tell what his downfield arm is. I didn't see a lot of him last year, but it's hard to tell what it is. But, I mean, come on, passes out in the flat, you know, uh, little look-in passes to the tight ends or stuff like that. You couldn't, you couldn't have that kind of safe passing game in the driving rain against a defense right. that's better than you? I mean, it just made no sense at all. You know, and then Penn State just started pinning their ears back. They knew they were only going to run the ball. They couldn't do anything. So, yeah. you know, either Pitt's not as good as people thought, which I'm not really sure we can make that assessment yet, or they just really weren't very well prepared, it seemed, that particular night. that, that like they, It seemed as just they should have been better prepared, and the coaching staff in particular. So. Which, which makes you nervous because – if you can't prepare kids for a game like this, what the hell are you? How are you going to get them prepared for the other ones? It uh, I mean, it, this, it worried me. This is worried right. me. And this if your kids are that weak that you, you because you got stuffed on a strange call by your coaching staff, you know, on a fourth and three, as you say, two plays that went absolutely nowhere, didn't even get an inch. If, if you're going to get if you're going to get intimidated that much by that, if that was the case, we'll never know. But if it was. That's a little bit alarming, you know. Yeah. So, um, you know, but I didn't, I didn't see Penn State do anything that showed that they were clearly the much more talented team. I mean, they did have a couple guys at some of the skill positions, the running back in particular, that a little quicker, a little quicker to the holes, maybe a little bit stronger as the game rolled on. But right. I can't think of anything they did defensively that said, boy, this team's a, there's a bunch of animals out there. Yeah. So uh, you're right. I mean, if, if, if in fact that you got that shook, because the weather was bad and because the tide swung against you and you thought you should be ahead, what are you going to do as other adversity hits you with, you know, ten games to go? So, right. I mean, it, it's a little bit worrisome. It really is. So, yeah. you're right. I think this weekend is going to tell a lot. I mean, because I don't think Georgia Tech's a world beater either. The little bit yeah. that I've seen, some of the highlights and stuff, I think that's a winnable game. But you really better be rebounding big, I think, or, you know, unfortunately, uh, nobody's going to take them seriously as a, as a, as a yeah. contender or anything. No, no, no. I would tend to think this, to me, is is probably the most important game of the year coming up because if you lose this one at home, I think it's going to be a long season, gentlemen. Could be. Now, yep. Now, Fletch, would you have called Narduzzi a busher? He, I was just getting ready to say that that whole staff was a busher. Listen, that fourth and three, that, that was the turning point. But the other part of it, you know, Gary, you're right. I mean, there was not a lot of looking down the field um, when, when there was pressure. But at the same token, guys, I didn't see a lot of receivers open. And I think that was a problem. But, but I also think that, you know, you need to adjust your game plan. You need to, to make sure that there are a few quick, easy passes to build a little confidence because he was running for his life out there. And it just – it got to the point where – to me, the, the game was over when the safety happened. That was it. They were done. In fact, oh, yeah. that's when I – that's actually yeah. when I turned the game off at that point. But, yeah. you know, it was, it was not an imaginative uh, attack at all. Uh, I thought that the first half, if they would have gotten through that first half, down by a point or, you know, possibly taking that field goal that they should have, I think it's a different ball game, fellas. I really do. But, yeah. you know, it, it, you can't – and, Dave, you're also right, too. This is not an athletic director that's going to put up with a lot of this. But there there are a couple things that I walked away with. One, James Franklin is a dick. We're, we're going to just come out and say that. That didn't change at all. But he may uh, rethink his decision. One of the things that they talked about before this game was, you know, the, the reason for not scheduling Pitt. And that there was no real – there's nothing really to be gained for Penn State in this because – you know, it, it was not a guaranteed win that you need to have if you're going to be in championship contention. Well, you know what, guys, the way Pitt played, you may want to rethink that. That could be a guaranteed win, the way that that, that, that played out. Yeah. Uh, just, I agree. just horrible, horrible 
And, you know, in terms of the, the players being up for it, this game doesn't really mean that much to those younger players. This is not really a rivalry game. Um, for most of them, Pitt Penn State really didn't mean anything. So it, it, it's for us, and it's actually for people in the western part of the state where it's really a, a rivalry game. You know, people in out in, in central and eastern Pennsylvania, I don't think they really care about the, the Pitt game. They really don't. Not unless you're of a certain age, uh, then it's not an important game anymore. And that's a shame. But, you know, one of the problems is, is, is with this whole conference realignment that, you know, you have to schedule cupcakes if you're going to be in the hunt at the end. And, and what they need to do is they need to be able to say that if you're in a Power 5 conference, you have to play X amount of Power 5 opponents. So maybe you get one of those games back that, that you can do for, like, a, a Pitt West Virginia or a Pitt Penn State. But the way that the system is now, there's, there's no advantage for Penn State to schedule this game. Well, there and, they're pretty, and, and they're pretty upfront the about that. Yeah, if you look at the Pitt schedule of non-conference the last few years, that'll show you why you shouldn't do that. They've had the hardest non-conference schedule two years in a row, and they're pretty much going to get their ass kicked in the non-conference schedule. Yeah. So, you know. And I agree with you. They they need to do things to kind of force people to play more important games. One of them may be you don't get in you get an automatic bid to the the tournament if they expand it to eight, but that obviously isn't going to happen. But I mean that would force. Well, them yeah, and that's what they that's really what they need to do. Um, yeah. And it, it's just um, it's a shame, but at the same time, this was an opportunity for Pitt. They could have gotten out of this. At a, you know, this four-game contract with with Penn State at two and two, and that's a huge victory. It also becomes a huge recruiting thing within Pennsylvania. Right. Last night did not help their cause in terms of, of recruiting locally and no. within the state of Pennsylvania. Now, the talent level is not the same as it was when we were growing up in Pennsylvania. We, you know, we at one time it was Pennsylvania, Texas, California; those are the big ones. Um, not so much anymore. I mean, the WPAL is not producing the same number of players as it had in the past. And, and, you know, that's a demographic thing besides, you know, a lot of other factors. But, you know, you're seeing a, a pit team that that was a, a potential yesterday for, a, you know, to make a good recruiting statement, and it, it, it didn't happen. No. And if you look at over the years, too, and, you know, one of the things we talked about earlier in the weekday was – you know, there's a, a piece that came out in the, in the in the trib that was talking about comparing the all-time uh, rosters from Penn State and from Pitt in terms of, of NFL success. And Pitt, by and large, has done really well at, at getting guys in the NFL. And a lot of it too was it was coaching. I mean, you had you knew if you were going to play for Dave Blunt that you were going to be pro ready. You knew if you were going to play for Walt Harris if you were particularly if you were a wide receiver or a quarterback. You were you were going to be groomed and you were going to be attractive. I mean, look, Pete Gonzalez has got to look at look that he wouldn't have gotten without Paul Harris around him. Um, so they've always Pitt's always been the one that has been able to produce good players. I mean, you look at Aaron Donald now; the guy's a monster, one of the best players in the NFL. And Penn State, while they've had some success at you know linebacker, you and you know some running backs, although. Recently, any running back from Penn State that comes into the league is, 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 a, is an iffy proposition. But they always had that ability to to coach somebody up, to get them into the pros. Last, yesterday's game did not help them. That's not going to be a good recruiting thing that we just saw yesterday because of the way it went. It happened. They looked like they were out class. They were out coached. They were not prepared. They when they got down and they panicked. And that's not the sign of a program that you want to sign up for. No. And, and, you know, quite frankly, we're going into the second year of of this happening. I mean, these are um, Pat Narduzzi's players at this point. Paul Chris players are are, are gone. And, you know, I mean, Chris was not a defensive recruiter, um, didn't bring much defensive help in, but – he um, 
he understood the value of an offensive line. Right. He understood what what an offensive line could do for um, his skill position players. And when you look back at Narduzzi's first two years with the team, I mean, you you had a great offensive line. You had um, good skill position players that came from Christ. You're not seeing those players come in right now. And well, and, and it's not it's not an ideal place to play. It's not an ideal place to coach. And I think that, that you know, Pitt fans have to realize that that there's a this is not a gem place to land. It's not. No. How do you make it a gem place to land? Is it possible well, that, to make a gem place to land? Well, I think it has to be. I mean, you're playing you're playing in a good conference. Uh, the academics by being in, in the ACC. Pretty top notch, and even at Pitt. I mean, Pitt, Pitt gets a lot of NIH grants. I mean, it's one of the leading research universities in the country. And now, when you have a reciprocal agreement with some of those other ACC schools, you know, academically, you, it's a top notch place to go. I remember for, you know, when we were growing up, Pitt was a lot of people's safety schools. You right. know, and, right. and that's not that's not the case anymore. So, so it's there are a lot of different factors with that. Um, you know, people are going to talk about the on-campus uh, stadium versus having it at Heinz Field. I don't think it really matters. No. I mean, that's not really part of the whole thing. I mean, a lot of colleges don't have their – I mean, I think it could uh, actually work positively for you. I mean, I think if you had big-time athletes and you're recruiting them from other places, playing in an NFL type of stadium, if you could draw 40, 45,000. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, it works absolutely. the other it works for It works as a positive, actually. I think not a Well, yeah, they I mean, won that won 10 games that year, the year they lost to Cincinnati in the worst uh, blessed time uh, I was ever in Heinz Field. Uh, the late the late second comeback, uh, I think it was 35-6, to six, Pitt was winning. Nonetheless, that season, there were actually 45,000 in a game. Um, when they had a shot at winning the conference, and they were looking like one of the better teams in the country. So I agree with you. I think it can happen. I think that um, would get kids from other parts. I mean, I, I think, Fletch, your point is right on. Unfortunately, all of Pennsylvania, you know, there's been a little bit of a slowdown in it, but there's really a population decline, and there's a gradual yeah. flight. And it's not any different in western Pennsylvania. A lot of those people no, that were, were producing tons of football talent, just they don't, those towns are a third of the size they used to be out there now steel towns and things like that. And it's the same in eastern Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania, too. And you guys are right. I mean, I think, um, you know, I'm not sure it doesn't matter to people in the eastern part of the state. I think it's something that they would talk about and pay attention to. I think that the move to different conferences is hurt. But, um, boy, I'll tell you, when you have a night like that, you know, a kid that's on the fence in Jersey or Delaware or something like that, and he's getting recruited by both and he thinks he's good enough to play regularly, who do you think yeah. he's going to pick? You know, it had to be competitive. They didn't have to win it, but it had to be competitive. They had to give them a rough time. And, they gave and you know, time. and by and large, for a lot of the first uh, the first half it was. And, Dave, you know, you and I were texting, and I kept saying to you, like, he's got to stop. He's got to get some pocket presence because yep. they became one-dimensional. And, yep. once, and, again, they got behind and they panicked. And there was – that team was not made to mount a comeback. I mean, you you look at you talk about the big games at the end of the year last year. There were no comebacks there. That was Pitt getting out in front. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, I mean, they did against Miami. Um, although Pickett in the second half, don't forget they were down by two touchdowns to Virginia Tech when Pickett came no, into that game. That's um, true. But um, I, I think part of the problem was they uh, he was getting squeamish, no problem. But I don't think there's a lot of talent. Uh, in the receiving core, or, or maybe it's just they're they're so damn young that you know they're not uh, uh, not to the point uh, of development yet, or maybe Sean Watson just sucks as an offensive coordinator. I mean, that's he, he wasn't real impressive last year either. If you're, uh, scrambling. I remember having these same conversations last year with you that it just seemed like a predictable, predictable thing. Right. I I mean, yeah, you're, and, you're and right about the academic. Uh, you know, coming coming from their last offensive coordinator, where they were putting up points left and right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, he, if, if if the Penn State defensive line was actually making Pickett feel like he was under pressure, I mean, it's, it's faster down there, and there's more air traffic down there than you see on TV or even in the stands. We all know that. Any sport, any sport where there's contact, in particular, it's sure. a lot different when you're down at the field level. But 
whatever the reasons were, you know, you're not you're not asking Pickett anymore in today's. It's not Dan Marino days. You're not asking him to figure it out. The coaching staff should have said, all right, start, start throwing a ball out in the flat a little bit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Start like there was no. I mean, okay, so they can't get open downfield. Penn State's putting too much pressure on the pocket. The pocket's collapsing. Pickett's moving. Okay, we're not getting any breakaway, you know, space downfield. All right, start throwing the ball in little, you know, dunk passes. Do something to slow the the momentum then. And it just yeah, like, a couple a couple of well timed screen passes. Yeah. That's gonna slow. That's gonna slow a rush down. You know, or, or you three seconds and you know, three second releases. Get the ball out of there quickly. But the problem I had, Gary, is is when he did pull the ball down, he pulled the ball down. He didn't look downfield as he was moving. That ball was under his arm, and he was running. Worried me there was too. no looking for any any other option. And what was and the that's, reason? That's what I kept trying to figure out. But, but no part, of, part of that was because he he wasn't doing those short things, or he was doing the short things to the to the outside, which were being covered. Um, right. 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 I mean, the, when you get an aggressive defense – you want to pop short little slants to the running back over the, the middle, uh, a little right. further out to the um, to a wide receiver or a tight end, things that are just quick pops to back them up a little bit. I think they were going for things a little deeper. I don't think they were open. And, yes, Pickett um, um, did, uh, did get a little nervous too quick. There's no doubt about that. But I just don't think But your receivers coming. also have to bail you out. Your receivers have right. to come back to you whenever you see that happening. Right. And I don't think that they made the adjustments because, because you know, granted I wasn't at the game, but I, I can tell you from looking at some of the replays, I didn't see people open. No. When they would show it up high, you're right, Fletch. I agree. There was nobody wide. They, they couldn't seem to get anybody loose in any kind of open with any open. So then, you know what? Run some rub routes. Do something that you're able to disrupt right. the coverage. You know, do you? You've got to make the adjustments, and they made. They did not make the adjustments, and. and and that was the problem. It, it was. And maybe Watson's just not the guy for the job. But, you know, the decision lies with the head coach. And, you know, I, I, I've i been an Arduzzi fan. I, I like his enthusiasm. I, I think he has a sound defensive structure, which I think showed for a good portion uh, of the game last night until it got out of control. Yeah. But I, I just – I, I just can't get over the undiscipline. I've never seen a toss of a coin. I mean, it might sound stupid, but to me, that, that's like the ultimate show of um, of having a disorganized team. Yeah. I mean, that, that's an important. It doesn't sound important, but on a, a night where there's heavy wind and rain, yeah. that's really important to get off to a good start, making yeah. that, that proper decision, giving them the ball in the rain. And when you're an underdog, win. too, you don't want really- to – you know, you don't want to get down like that because you know they, they've got they've got more weapons than you do. And you know, in, in the re- and as soon as it begins to the snowball, you're done. Yeah, yeah, and they they were done. They were absolutely 14, done. fourteen infractions for 116 yards. I mean, that's yeah. a staggeringly high number in a game that, quite frankly, you probably are outmanned a little bit, and with bad weather, kind of even in the playing field, so to speak. So, right. I mean, it's just, it's, but for it's God's sake, again. somebody somebody get the punter a pair of gloves. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus, right. I agree. I agree. I agree. I felt bad for that kid, man. He That was an 11-point swing right there in the first half. Yeah, it was. On him. It was. It was. So, uh, I, 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 all, I, all I could picture is during that, that, that muffed punt thing was, was the sound, either a Jerry Lewis noise or, or a, a, a Curly Howard noise by the punters. He was back there going, yeah, that's the only thing I could picture that was happening at that point. <laughs> he kind of oh, kind of half see that. Like, I mean, he kicked it right into the Penn State kid's like stomach too. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was like it was like he, it was like he kicked like a like a dead bird's body or something into <laughs> Penn State. And then the the other side was was, was would be the uh, the. The, the guy who blocked the punt making the noise like the skipper when he gets hit in the stomach in Gilligan's Island. That was the other thing that was missing. <laughs> it lights up the game. Yeah, it did. It did. Now, that's, now I'll be thinking about that next time I see a block punt. Somewhere. Oh, man. Oh, God. Oh, it was ugly. But that's okay because we had today. We're going to Cleveland. We don't lose in Cleveland. Okay. <laughs> You know, so we're, we're going to get more bitter, Dave. It's just going to get I'm more sorry? bitter. I have a feeling it is. So, 
Oh, well, you know, it it was a game that, that couldn't have gone more perfect for the Steelers. You had a defense who was uh, widely questioned uh, uh, over the summer, and I thought played pretty damn good today. I mean, they had a couple um, uh, a couple of mix-ups. Uh, you know, Sutton uh, uh, got burned on the on the one la- uh, long pass by stopping, and and Hilton, who played a decent game, I, I thought got burned a couple times. But other than that, they played well. T.J. Watt, four sacks, eleven uh, tackles, was solid. Dupree uh, was was coming in. The the backfield did well. I mean, they pretty much stopped the Browns. I mean, uh, Jim or um, uh, Connor uh, couldn't have had a better game. 135 yards, two touchdowns, even with the fumble. Um, 192 total total yards. I mean, he more than made up for what Bell would have done. Um, I mean, looking at Bell's performance last year with no practice. I thought Connor was spectacular. Yep. To me, the problem in this game, and I know I'm, I'm going against the 10,000 uh, Tomlin sucks, fire him uh, responses I, I have on my Facebook page right now. The problem with this game wasn't Mike Tomlin. The problem with this game, I was I was very happy with the way the Steelers played for the most part, except for Ben. Yeah. Ben came out, and even though he had his 335 yards, he did not throw the ball well. He did not make good decisions. Um, to me, two of those interceptions were right right on him. Um, I mean, he uh, the play where he he's going down late in the game and he he tries to flip the ball to Connor. Um, luckily, Connor held on to it, but that was a potential disaster right there. Yep. The guy just didn't make many good decisions today. They had six turnovers. Yeah, they had a lot of dumb penalties, but to me, six turnovers, five of which come from him, four of which are on his shoulder because he. He tried to wait too long for a play that wasn't developed, and he made just two moronic passes. The other one bounced off uh, James' hand, I believe. But he oftentimes overthrew open receivers. He just did not play well. And that's where this loss comes in. I'm feeling good about the Steelers right now. Feeling good if they don't see Bell for five or six weeks. Um, Very impressed with the defense today. I mean, you give up six turnovers – and only seven points off those turnovers. That's remarkable. Yep. Um, I mean, you know, it was a nasty day. It was rainy. It was windy. The kicking wasn't there. but um, And you salvaged the tie out of it. But, um, you know, to me this lies on Ben's shoulders. This game lies completely on his shoulders. And, and um, you know, I hope we're not uh, seeing the beginning of the end here. Or the uh, Rudolph uh, era may may start a little uh, little earlier than we think. Uh, Fletch, did you have a chance to uh, catch any of it? Well, fellas, the the good news is that I DVR'd that because I, I I wasn't able to watch the game much of the game. I saw about a half an hour of it. The bad news is that I'm going to eventually have to watch it. So that's uh, that that's the good and bad of it. But. Um, I saw that I did, did see the first Ben interception. It, it just one of those uh, those ones that you would think a, a guy who's been in the league that long would just not make that throw. You know, just throw it away, throw the ball away. It's not it's not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, I was you know just looking at some of the stats. The last time a Steeler had four sacks, Chad Brown. That's how far. That's wow. how long ago it was. And, you know, T.J. Watt, you know, one of the things that, you know, when we talk about, when we come to the bold prediction part of our, our show here, mine is going to be talking about the Steelers. And one of my big questions going into the season was J.J. Watt because he you didn't see much of him in the preseason. He hasn't been healthy, but he had a monster game. He did. Uh, I think the switch for, was good for Bud Dupree. I mean, the one sack that I did see that, that J.J. Watt did get uh, was forced by Dupree. You know, forced uh, Taylor right to J.J. Uh, Watt. Uh, Dupree also had a had a you know a sack of his own. So I mean, I, I would agree with you, Dave. The, the, here's one of the things that I have that's a little concerning, and that's Joe Hayden. Once again, Joe Hayden gets hurt. Uh, he's mm-hmm. not. He's he's a very effective cornerback when he's healthy. Unfortunately, the last few years that hasn't been the case. And the hamstring in, injury is one of those ones, you, as you know, guys that. 
that's not one of those ones that goes away right away. No. And, you know, to Todd Haley's credit, once Joe Hayden went down, uh, he knew where to focus. Yeah. And, and that was, that was one of the problems there too. And, you know, you know, you feel bad for James Conner. I mean, you're right, Dave, you had a hell of a game, but I can guarantee you the only thing he's thinking about on that bus ride back, uh, is the fumble. And that, and that's the thing that's uh, going to haunt him. Which but, ironically was because of the glove. Pitt punter needs a glove. James Conner had to take his off. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah. But, you know, the, the, the thing about it too is that um, my other fear going into this game was that, uh, the, that Connor was going to miss a blitz pickup and Ben was going to get knocked into next week. Um, but, you know, that, I didn't see that happen, at least for the part that I saw. So, I mean, there are some good things to, to take away from it. But, you know, the other thing, too, guys, is you, you think about this prolonged era of Steeler excellence. One of the reasons that they've been good for so long is, is they were given two games against the Browns every year, which is pretty much guaranteed wins. Right. Cleveland's better than they were. I mean, they, 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 there's still a lot of problems there, don't get me wrong, but they've got a lot of high draft picks on that team, and especially on the defense, they, they've really made some improvements. So you, then you have, you have Baltimore that this year I don't think is going to be as good as last year, and you have Cincinnati who will find some way to self-destruct. So I think a lot of the, the Steelers' success has been, you know, because of the division that they played. And there were a lot of games last year, and we'll, I'll talk about this later, that, that they escaped last year that maybe they, they wouldn't have another year. So I think they were very deceptive 13-3 and three last year. Yeah, they proved that way. That's correct. Yeah. But, uh, you know. But now, yeah. but, but, you know, I – I don't even want to go and look at my Facebook page because, my God, did I talk smack to a lot of people coming into this game. So now I'm going to have, I'm going to, have to eat a very big shit sandwich this next week. And I'm not happy about that, fellas. I'm not happy about it. Be careful of that social media flash. No, no, which shit sandwich? Oh, that might be why Gary's not on Facebook. <laughs> I'm, I'm nervous about it. So, uh, oh. What, what would, what that wouldn't make him a cold-hearted be. bastard, would it, Fletch? <laughs> <laughs> Too many wackos out there, including the three on this uh, podcast. But uh, there's even ones that are worse than us. So, so what, well, here's, here's, here's the other good. The other good news is at least the Pirates didn't lose. Yeah. They're 500. <laughs> Play a makeup. You gotta go. You guys gonna go to that makeup on October the first after the rest. I, I hope you're coming down for it. <laughs> I hope you're gonna make the five and a half hour trip for it. That's unbelievable. The, the extra walk-up gate is going to be another thousand seats beyond the seat <laughs> holders of ten thousand. So, I mean, well, is. that was the fun thing about yesterday's game was you saw nothing but Pitt and Penn State shirts in the pirate crowd, which yeah. led me to believe the only people who went to the damn game were people who wanted to get a parking space early down, for the football yeah. game. Get out of the rain a little bit. Yeah. Yep. Oh know. man. Well, before we go to you, Gary, I want to know, Fletch, what shit sandwich are you going to uh, hate eating the most—the Penn State one or or the Browns one? Oh my God! I think I think it's like the shit sandwich platter is what. It is. Instead of getting fries, you get an extra shit sandwich. I think that's what it is. I don't even want to know what the gravy is, my friend. <laughs> oh man! Yeah, did you get a chance to watch the Steeler game? I did. I pretty much watched it. We, uh, I, uh, my, uh, my partner uh, got so frustrated during some of the penalties, she decided to go over and make herself a drink and start making dinner even in the third quarter i think she oh, got wow I, I i you're right dave about the penalties but i thought a lot of the penalties though kind of resembled some of the dumbness we saw in the in the pit game though yeah i mean you know there was a couple like ripping your helmet off just because you know why do these idiots on the outside have to get in these scraps that mean nothing to the play and cost their teams 15 yards if i was a coach in the nfl in particular I don't care how good you are. Some of these guys would sit. I mean, all this shit talking and intimidation stuff is just nonsense. It's one thing if you make a big play at the right time and you do a little bit of talking or something. But, I mean, that 15-yarder, there was a couple, like, defensive holding penalties on plays that weren't even well executed by the Browns. I thought they, they their discipline today, I thought, really stunk, honestly, yeah. a little bit, too. And you're right. I mean, the defense bailed it out by keeping the Browns off the board during some of that. But, I mean, you're not going to beat good teams with – 13 penalties for 100 plus yards as well, and you're not going to do it with dumb ones like that. You know, if you get a personal foul or something that's kind of a questionable one or whatever, but a couple of theirs were not questionable at all, in my view. Right. 
you know, hitting the quarterback well after the plays are hitting Taylor well after the plays over. I mean, yeah. come on. You know, these are a lot of veterans on this defense, like stuff like that. Well, that, that's the other thing, Gary. I mean, it's not like these guys are playing together for the first time. That's right. You, you can't, know, the, you can't the, They're wearing <laughs> name tags and saying, hello, my name is. I mean, they've been playing together. They just, they can't you know, do it, too. I mean, you know, do you, do you turn NFL Network on in the locker room? They're talking about head injuries. They're talking about not hitting the court. You can't do this stuff. I mean, you're not above it. Like, it's, it's completely juvenile and self-centered to me. The Steelers aren't the only ones. But I think no. against a bad team in particular, why do it especially? Because you could probably beat them anyway. And right. I don't know, Dave, I don't have a lot to add to what you guys said. I thought, I thought Roethlisberger was not good. That was my take. I mean, twice he didn't have any peripheral vision at all. When he burped up both those fumbles, it's like he didn't even realize somebody was right on his back or his side. Yeah. You got to feel in key spots in the field as well, you know, like down deep yeah. in your own offensive zone and stuff like that. I mean, you know, the guy's had a tremendous career. He is the, probably the greatest quarterback in the in the franchise history. But today, today he was not particularly good. I mean, the, the interception we just threw the ball like a blimp down the center of the field for some reason. Why? I mean, that's something you see. Why? The, uh, you, you quarterback the play didn't even look close to being open. It was he? Yeah, Brown, he. You know, and then he's barking at Brown. Well, I mean, I think Brown wondered, what the hell is he doing? Like, he's not even supposed to be throwing me the ball in this play the way it looked, you know? Right. So, I mean, it, it looked, you know, it looked like one of those Linkowski kind of floaters halfway down the... Yeah. You know what? That's what I thought. From, Linkowski's you know, uh, face over the picked it off and ran it back for a touchdown or something. Uh, but, but I wonder if Ben threw up before the game. Like Linkowski was doing that. But, I mean, I thought Roethlisberger really had a poor day. He, he didn't really get Brown actively involved. Now, you know, they're, again, unless you're down there close, TV doesn't always do it just unless they show the high field shot. But the Browns might have been doing something to keep, you know, to keep Brown from being as much of a factor today. And, you know, you don't have Bell as well, so a little easier to key on him. But, with the but 93 yards. Had, he had 93 yards. That's not a bad day. But, I mean, was, but he didn't – But there, you know, do you remember him being a key part of key parts of drives of the game? I don't. No. You no. know, like he kind of had those statistics because, you know, they're going to him a lot. But I guess on the last touchdown drive he was involved a little bit more. He, uh, he, he got a little bit he, more involved he, in the overtime. Toward the end of the game. Yeah. Yeah, and in the overtime. But, but there was a lot of parts of the game where he was really kind of invisible. Now, again, the Browns might have been doing something to take that away. We'll never yeah. really know that. But – I thought Connor, you know, I'm not sure. Connor, they list Connor at, at what is it, 6'2"? We look 6'2", two, two, two. He doesn't look that big to me, you know. And no. and I don't know. He, I know you guys have said he's injured. I, I haven't paid as much attention as I'm doing now because I know we're going to talk about football more. But, um, you know, he, he just doesn't look like a guy that's going to be able to carry the ball that much 30 times, you know, per yeah. game at that level. He does, He's not a big house like Dylan or – you know, Corey Dillon right. used to be, or guys like that. So, I mean, they're going to have to figure out, if Bell doesn't come back, they're going to have to figure out, you know, how they're going to get somebody else involved there to carry the ball, because I don't think you're going to be able to do that, even with a spread offense. Right. right. So, no, I agree with you. You know, I just think, uh, they're, I think they're going to have to do something about that. But, you know, I think the Browns are probably a little bit better. I mean, the odds are with you at pro sports. Eventually it's going to even out. But, I mean, it really wasn't a game that it, they should end up losing, I felt, though. You know, I mean, I think no. if, you know, if, if you don't have those turnovers, Connors fumble, you handle the ball 32 times at the running back position at that level, there's a good chance you might lay one down. But I thought Roethlisberger's two fumbles where he really didn't have any sense at all, it seemed, about the, you know, no. the pressure around and, him. And Run they weren't call? quick sacks. What's that? They mean? weren't quick sacks at all. So you, you, at that point in time, have to realize it's eventually going to crumble. Right. Um, right. Although on the other end, people are excited saying that this isn't the Browns. How many teams do you know that get six turnovers, many in prime spots, and can only score seven points? I think this was very much a Browns uh, type of. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. I, I mean, I've never seen that before. Getting getting out out turnover six to one, and not winning a game. Yeah, I mean, yeah. being lucky in some ways to get a tie, even. If you took a yeah. couple key turnovers away in key spots, so that's right. I, I I wouldn't be too excited if I'm up in Cleveland either yet. Honestly. No, so, no. Well, for many other reasons. Sure, how beats in sixteen though. Yeah, I mean, and you knew it was going to happen. I mean, you knew eventually it would happen. I thought it would be a win, not a tie. But it's the first tie for Pittsburgh in what sixteen or seven years, or sixteen, seventeen, two thousand two. Yes, it's the first for the Browns in twenty some years, I think. 
Yeah. So, yeah, you just don't see it anymore. So, but, I mean, I think they did so, I mean, if Connor can play like that and they could give him a little bit of rest, not depend on him as heavy, Roethlisberger could kind of wake up a little bit and feel the pressure going on around him and not throw the ball all over the place willy-nilly, and they could get Brown a little bit more involved. That's probably a yeah. different game. Um, so, you know, hopefully they can figure those three things out. But, but you know, I, I don't think it's panic time at all, but uh, they, there's, they, they, the, the, the penalties and stuff reminded me quite a bit of – I felt like I was watching a little bit of the same thing Saturday night, honestly. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what it felt Except like. I'll, I'll, I'll take the tie over, over a 51-6 to six loss. Yeah. Yeah. In retrospect. But, um, um, well, we're going to go to our flash round now. A lot of big stories this week. Mr. Fletcher, what's your biggest story? Well, I had two. Um, my story of the week, and I'm, I'm going to say this. It was 31 years ago, Dave. You, know, you were young, and your nose was still developing at the time. <laughs> Gary, you were only mildly bitter. So for 31 years ago, boys, that's the last time Kentucky beat Florida. Whoa. So the, the Wildcats went into Gainesville, and they pulled off a stunner on Saturday, and they beat the Gators 27-16. And in the process, they ended a 31-game losing streak to their SEC East counterparts. I looked it up. It's the fourth longest streak in an uninterrupted series in NCAA history. So think about that. Wow. Um, so it's not so much of a uh, – the longest – oh, my goodness. Now, I'm, I think it was uh, – was it the – I think it was the uh, Navy Notre Dame. That was oh, the wow. longest one ever. I think that's they what it was. They every year. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Very they did cool. play every so, year for a while. Yeah. So here's the thing, guys, that, that I didn't even think about was, yeah, Kentucky might make some noise in the SEC. I mean, they're playing Murray State next week. Then they have Mississippi State and South Carolina. They both they have both those games at home. So, you know, they they then later in November, I think they have, they have Georgia. And, you know, it's really Georgia and, and whoever's around. I mean, the, there's really not a lot that's happening there. So at the very least, Kentucky not only broke that streak, but they announced to the SEC that they can, they can make some noise. And uh, like I said, it's Georgia and everybody else. So your new current long streak, it's Nebraska over Kansas State, 29 straight victories. Whoa. 29 straight. All right. Are they going to play soon? I'm not sure when, uh, when that one's going to happen again. And my other story, of course, was, was the Colin Ka- Kaepernick thing. And for me, two things came from that. One, Colin Kaepernick has an afro that's very Oscar Gamble-esque. Uh, that was, it's impressive, very impressive. And the other thing, too, I'm very happy. Gary, if you were on social media, you would see all the different memes that have come from this that have been very entertaining. But here's the thing, guys. Nike sales are up 31% since making that ad, so good for them. They knew what they were doing. Exactly. They knew what they were doing. It was it was a good thing. What was your favorite, Mem? Oh, probably the, the one from the, the, the guy from Karate Kid uh, was the, you know, uh, win at all costs, even if it means sweeping the leg. And then it was just do it. <laughs> Uh, that was good. I like I like the Tanya Harding one. Oh, the Tanya Harding one was beautiful also. Take him out at the knee. Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sacrifice everything, even if it means taking out a knee. Taking a knee. That's yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the phone was incredible. I, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to show you some pictures to, to see if uh, you think I, I would look good at my uh, uh, reframe fro. Uh, I'm so inspired by this. <laughs> I think you'd look like Larry Fine if you uh, if you got yours going. I don't know. <laughs> hey, guys, that, that's two yeah, Three Stooges references in one week. That's pretty I'm impressive. Oh, yeah. You just tell you. We must be watching Channel 53 again, Fletch. You must have. <laughs> All we need is an eye poke, and we'll get the Mo one in there, and we're good. <laughs> Uh, Gary, what is your what is your uh, big story of the week? Well, I mean, you know, I, I was gonna such kind of beat me to it. I I, I, didn't, I didn't think about the I knew Kentucky hadn't beaten really anybody of significance in the SEC for a while. I didn't realize they had such a long streak against Florida. That's that's pretty interesting. But yeah, I think the biggest story, and I'm not sure 
you know, we need to talk about it much more is the Kaepernick one. You know, I think, um, you know, Nike may have known what they're doing, but I, I do think they're taking a big risk long term there by some of that stuff. I mean, there's been some, there's been some sale of the shares and stuff and, Wall Street, I think, you know, they, they don't need other sponsors because they're a manufacturer. But I, I, it's going to be interesting to see how this develops. I mean, I think the thing about Kaepernick sacrificing everything is total bullshit. I mean, it, you know, if he sacrificed everything, he wouldn't have been looking for a backup job in the league. No. So, I mean, I think he wanted that. I think a lot of people figured, A, a he's really not that good. He had an eight-game run in that one Super Bowl year run, and then the league figured him out, figured him out and he really didn't do much. Number number one and number two, I think uh, if he really wanted to sacrifice everything, he would have left the game. He would have started some social cause. He wouldn't be looking to Nike to give him a paycheck. So I mean, I think uh, it's a, it's a crock. It's a typical Nike crock in my view. You know, spin the world the way you want to see it. Uh, but obviously, that's the biggest story of the week because it's got everybody talking. It's got people talking about sports that probably wouldn't pay any attention to it. Right. Uh, Although I will say something. I did read a uh, Sports Illustrated story this week um, because I wondered that myself. Uh, you know, what has this guy been doing? He actually has been uh, uh, doing some great things. Uh, with, he's given away almost a million dollars to just some great organizations. So, I, I mean, for all the criticisms he, he gets, and a lot of it is, is warranted, um, but the one thing is he, he basically has gone out and he's put his money where his mouth is, and he's, he's done a lot of good with organizations that really need the help. Um, and he's done it without um, bringing the cameras along, which is one thing that just pisses me off more than anything. If you're going to do something charitable, do it. Don't make sure you have cameras along so everybody can pat you in the back. So the, the guy but, has... But, uh, um, Dave, if he's done that, full credit to him. I didn't know that, so you know, yeah. I'm not... I'm not you know, I, I don't really... I, I'm not. I don't know. I didn't know that. And if he did that, full credit to it. But I think the yeah. thing to say that he sacrificed everything, I think, is a little bit of baloney. Because if that well, was the case, he wouldn't have been looking for another job in the league. And and I'm sorry. I mean, I think the one thing I heard when I was down in South Carolina is true. Just listened to sports talk radio a little bit on my iPad down there. Now, of course, that's primarily a college football and you know NASCAR racing, a little bit of baseball type of talk. But you know, I think. You know, if you're going to, if you if you work for an employer, and you're going to uh, violate what that employer wants you to do, uh, and you're going to, you know, go do that through various social media means, then you can't expect no repercussion back to you. So, I mean, I think, you know, in a way, I don't really feel sorry for Kaepernick. He made a decision, whether it was his decision originally or not. He made a decision, and you know, if the league. And the organizations that make up that league don't want to touch them. You know, I, if I went out and savaged the company I work for or the industry I'm in or, you know, did something that's controversial that they didn't support, you really can't expect them to welcome you back with open arms either. So, I mean, I think, unfortunately, you know, I think Nike's got the thing all wrong. You know, and, and honestly, how much money has Nike made off of institutions like the NFL and these NFL teams and, and everything else? So I, I, I'm not really sure – that just because their sales are up 31% for a couple of days, that that's going to be the end of the story. I don't think they're going to be going out of business, don't get me wrong. But I'm not but quite see, sure. The, the other thing, too, is that they've, they've never been shy about making a social commentary. They haven't been. And, you know, that's that's part of their their culture, and that's fine. It is. I, I, I think that um, at the end <laughs> of the day, Gary, I think you, you have to think that – they call him Kaepernick, even though you're right. I mean, his, a lot of his success came in, in that that one season and picking that one streak. But you cannot tell me that he there is not a second string quarterback out there that he's not better than. Because I, I have to really that. look at it, Fletch, to be honest with you. Uh, but I, I find it hard to believe that 32 other organizations would collude. Well, because it, not a well, backup because quarterback. Here's the, here's the thing: football more so than any other sport. They hate – what's the thing that they hate? They hate the distractions. Yeah. yeah. But you know what? Here's, here's the thing I wonder, guys. What would have happened in the 1960s if we had the same sort of access and Muhammad Ali did what he did? What would have happened in 1947 with the same sort of social media access and everything with Jackie Robinson? I mean, sports is always – there are people who make who try to make a stand and use that platform – in a way that that, that, that elevates them from, from sports. It happens all the time, but it's just a different world right now. And I think a lot of it, too, is 
there, there's a, a lot of those things that have been posted to are not true. So there's a lot of baiting uh, of, of other groups, too. So, I mean, it's, it's really interesting to look back at that and think about, you know, the, some of the sacrifices. And you, you look at people like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, too, and some of the, some of the stances that he took over the years. In, in, a, in, a, in the era that we're in now with social media, the 24 hours like that, you know, how would they, how would they be looked at now? It's really interesting. Well, Muhammad Ali would never become Muhammad Ali because he wouldn't have been given the opportunities um, to um, uh, to come back with his career as he was. And, and don't forget, um, imagine in this era, if a man refused to go into the military, such as he did, oh, he he would have he would have never gotten the opportunities to to come around for that. Um, I I mean. Was Ali bolder than Kaepernick? Of course. I, I think at the beginning when Kaepernick did it, I'm not quite sure he knew quite what he was doing with this. It was it was it was an empty gesture. I think he kind of found himself through all this and and has uh, really done an incredible uh, uh, job giving back to the community. But, but here, here's uh, my problem with Kaepernick. He has been quiet. He's he's let other people have the dialogue. Instead of coming out and, and really saying this, this is what I believe in. This is why he's been he's been let he's let other people's frame him, frame him on this, and, and that was not the way to go about this. If, you, if you're going to do what you're going to do like that, you know, make sure that you need to be articulate enough to stand up there and say this is what you know. Before you say that I that I'm being disrespectful to the military, that has nothing to do with it. This is the reason why I'm doing this. And really make that clear. And, and he. Got to a certain point, but didn't do that, and and that's where I fault him. I, and I would agree with you. I don't think he ever got to that point, and and that's why I I always claim I have no problem with people making a protest. Hell, if you look in the crowd uh, when people are singing the national anthem, there's about thirty percent of the people shoving food in their face, bullshit, right. taking pictures. Yeah. And that's disrespectful. I mean, yeah. I mean, this guy in this situation. My problem with him is I, I'm not quite sure he knew what he was protesting. I mean, yes, yeah. yes, it was uh, um, for for police abuse, but what do you do about it? What did this do about it? Um, you know, it's it's almost like the the Major League Baseball with the Chief Wahoo incident. Yeah, great. I don't think anybody was hugely offended, but what are you doing to make making right. Native Americans' lives better? Nothing. Right. I mean, fine, there's no Chief Wahoo. There's still uh, just incredible poverty in the Native uh, uh, American um, uh, areas, and, and there, there's hunger. There, there's education issues. There, there are great organizations that can come out and help, but no, let's pull Chief Wahoo off, off the Indian patch, and it's all better now. You know, they're, they're hollow. It's, it's activism in the, in the 21st century. Uh, what I would have hoped uh, Kaepernick would have done is what you said, Fletcher. Come out and and you know put his money towards supporting politicians who who supported his cause, um, charities that supported his cause. Um, get out there and and do what Jim Jim Brown did, do what Abdul Jabbar did, do what Ali did, and get the um, get the discussion out there. They did an incredible job um, when they were um, at the height of their athletic uh, careers. Um, so I would agree with that, but I, as I said, I give the guy credit. At least he went out and he, he's made a difference with his money. And don't forget to throw. Uh, again, I'm inspired. Wouldn't that look great coming out of my hat? I, I'm going to hide the baldness. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I think that's the best part of it. But uh, let me get to the mind because my, one thing I'll say though, and I don't, and I, honestly, I don't think Kaepernick's ever been able to verbally from the beginning explain his position on this. I don't think he's ever been able to do it because, honestly, I'm not sure he's the only one behind it. I mean, one of the people I know here who follows the NFL pretty closely said that some of the people around him, including a girl, former girlfriend, were, you know, fairly politically active like in Oakland and things like that. It kind of pushed him to do it, particularly when he got some popularity. And because he's never been able to come out and say anything or even explain himself, well, no. uh, that tells me that maybe there's some truth to that. And, and honestly, I just don't buy – you know, there's enough clowns in the NFL as it is with Jones and some of these people that own the Eagles, you know, the principals back here in the East. You know, they, 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 love, to, they love to show, you know, how 
much uh, Jones in particular, how much they'll give somebody a second chance. I mean, you're telling me that 32 people and 32 plus 32 general managers and everybody else would collude just to say that because this guy decided to kneel during a national anthem, we can't use him. I mean, there's something else. I think it's I think it's economic. I think that for the money he's going to command or ask for, I, I don't know, Fletch. I'm not with you. I, I think that. They well, I also think that, that that they also fear Donald Trump. I think. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, don't, I think they don't. I think the NFL, the NFL is a, is, has always been a, 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 hypocr- a hip, hip, hypocrisy to me. You know, yes, I, said I agree. Before, you know, I mean, family entertain. Well, we, we, we you know, we, we, we're big on United Way, but then when you start looking into it, they really didn't contribute that much to United Way, just like we've seen with baseball. You know, they use that to basically get, you know, public acceptance. Well, it's family entertainment, but we got strippers on the sidelines. I mean, you know, it's just, it's, it's well, always. Here's the other, here's the other thing, Gary. The only reason that they had the players out during the national anthem and all of that is because the military was paying them. That never happened when we were growing up. That's a, that's that's a, a relatively new thing. So then you know to force this patriotism thing is complete bullshit. I mean I don't I don't I don't know why people are so bothered by the fact that if some somebody wants to hold up a fist or they want to I don't know why that's setting so many people off. The other that's the reason our military is there in the first place is to allow people to have the right to do that. I'm with you. I mean I, I think both sides are a little bit. Both sides need to kind of get off the, uh, the the white hot intensity about the thing and decide why and shut up so, about it. Yeah, and, and shut up exactly. I mean, eventually, yeah. eventually, it'll for some people who want to do that and do something with it. If Kaepernick's one of them, that's good. You know, I mean, I, I get to, this guy Jenkins here has a big mouth. He's not really doing anything in this city, it turns out. You know, uh, and this guy Long, who's Howie Long's son from. Virginia, he's another big mouth, but you know, they, nobody can prove what they're really doing here, you know. And I'm not, but I'm not waving the flag either. I mean, I think you know, you know, the the I think both sides just can we just get off of it? I mean, I'm tuning in for a football game, or I'm tuning in to watch this stuff. I'm tired of it. If they were really interested in getting off it, and I, I don't understand why they haven't done it already, just don't broadcast the damn thing. Well, that's kind of what they're doing now, right? They don't show the national anthem now, right? Is that what they're going to try? On Thursday, they they had like. 20 cameras panning every player looking for somebody kneeling. Did they? Did they? I didn't see Thursdays because it, it was ridiculous. It, it, luckily, they didn't find it, but I, I just, you know, just don't do it. I, I Again, I care about what I do. I'm, I don't look and see what the hell anybody else is doing, and nor do I understand why people care. And you're right, Fletch. Every, every veteran, I'm sure there's some that are offended by it, but the ones I've talked to, basically they said that. That's why we fought for it. You know, yeah, I mean, I don't uh, think it's as big of a deal as some of these, you know, uh, particularly like Trump type of supporter it, is it, raging it's on a, all about. I think it's a little bit it's silly. It's anyway. a big deal because we, we are living in a gang society because of uh, uh, social media and politics, and people are afraid they're not going to be not not different from the McCarthy in, in the fifties. People were afraid they'd be associated with communism. People don't want to be associated as anti-American, so. That's why they they choose to go on one side or the other. But the thing I'm most interested in is you had said earlier there were strippers on the sideline. I want you to expound on that a, a little bit first. <laughs> Just open your eyes, you can see them. So yeah, Man. thirty-two. Oh no, there's only two. What Pittsburgh doesn't have it, and what what other? What is it? The Giants? Only two don't have it, right? I'm giving up my damn tickets. Have. I didn't know others had strippers. <laughs> But, I mean, just the idea of, well, this is family entertainment. Yeah, well, then how do you explain some of this stuff? No, I, I, I agree with you. It's, it's I mean, it's kind of – the NFL, to me, has always turned my stomach that way. Yeah. You know, I mean, they all – you know, they're all – they all have their issues. The NBA, the NHL with the – ignoring the head injury stuff and the NBA with uh, some of their own issues. And they all have Major League Baseball with, you know, pink and blue. Yeah. They all have their – their hypocrisy, but boy, the NFL just for years to me has just gotten away with it. They just breathe it, and, and again, I'm not saying it's good to stand up. I'm not saying it's not. I'm just saying the NFL needs to shut the hell up about it and, and let it go. That's right, and you know, if you don't want to buy Nike stock or you want to dump it, go ahead. If you want to buy more Nike products because of this, go ahead. Ultimately, ultimately, the market will determine what's the best thing to happen, and, and I don't know. I mean, I think... Kaepernick's, Kaepernick's history of success was not very long. 
He lost the job the very next year, about halfway through the season. Oh. And he became I mean, the let's, third. Let's say, if he was Tom Brady, then it wouldn't be a problem. It's, right. it's about they don't want – it's not necessarily colluding in my eyes. It's the fact what, this guy is going to be at best a, a backup option. Why do we want to create all this controversy for this? And, and that's exactly not unsimilar to the Steelers signing uh, Michael Vick. Although I, laugh I, I understand when they, when they promised us a huge protest, and there were eight people outside the stadium with anti Michael Michael Vick signs. But um, yeah, I mean, you know. I, hey, here, I, you know here's, here's the thing about Michael Vick, though. Michael Vick did his time. I agree. And, I agree. And he's done uh, things for the good of of his his crime since he's been out. Right. He's he's made a man. He was pretty open know, when he was here about, you know, that was pretty normal to him, and I'm sure growing up in some rough part of West yeah. Virginia probably was. Uh, you know, he was a pretty good citizen when he was here. He certainly wasn't a, an ego-driven, look-at-me no. kind of guy. I wouldn't, no. say he was, I wouldn't say he was highest on the uh, education level that you'd ever run right. into. But, uh, well, he, he was no Duquesne guy, that's for sure. Well, that's, uh, well that's, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, I mean, that's a different echelon from everything else in the world. But um, but you know but he I, might I have thrown up so, before games too. You know, I, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Quarterbacks get messed up in that league, yeah. And somebody's going to need a backup, so it'll be interesting to see if somebody does offer it. And then is sacrificing everything and Nike's ridiculous commentary to that regard. If they really looked into it, will look foolish if he ends up signing a contract oh. somewhere. Although I will say something on the other end, I seem to remember reading a story. I'll have to look it up where John Elway did claim he offered Colin Kaepernick a job, and he turned it down. So, okay, well, yeah. if that's the case, then I guess maybe that's worth saying that then. I didn't yeah. know that. So I, I, I do remember reading that somewhere. I'll have to look up just to verify. Um, but, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a controversy that's not going to go away. I, I personally um, think it was, it was genius what Nike did. Because I, I'm a full believer from a, a business aspect of it. I'm a full believer of any publicity is good publicity. And all these memes that are out there and all these people burning their feet, ironically the guy burning burning his Nike shoes with his, his foot in it and uh, burning his feet with a Nike emblazoned on it just makes me laugh my ass off. That's a bright thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, – but I'll tell you, that's on, on the controversial end. Um, he had his chance. Yeah, John Elway blames Colin Kaepernick. Um, he he had his chance to be here, uh, according to this, this is a CBS uh, thing. Um, he said John Elway said that Kaepernick could have a job if he wanted to. In other words, Elway blames Kaepernick for not taking the Broncos' offer when it was on the table. So he was offered a job, which basically would. In essence, if that's true, and I have no reason to believe it's not, uh, as I'm reading it here, that would pretty much negate his his um, uh, case in the end, I would think. Yeah. No, but arbitrators <laughs> said let, let it go to court, so we'll see what happens. Exactly. But anyways, my big, big story of the week happened yesterday. There were so many blowouts going on in college football, you'll never guess what I did. I flipped to tennis. Oh. I could, I don't love it, but it was the final. And I flipped at a time when um, um, Serena Williams was having a meltdown to the um, uh, to the Empire. Now, what had happened was he had warned her once because he claimed her coach. You're not allowed to coach from the stands. Yeah. Okay. Uh, she claimed she's never cheated in her life. Well, everybody's cheated in their life, so that's a lie right there. Um, but whether she knew he was coaching or not, the guy admitted to coaching. The guy said afterwards, yeah, I was coaching. We all coach. So that's against the rules. Whether they call it usually or not, I don't know. Maybe they should, but it doesn't make it right. So he warned her for that. He didn't take anything away. Then she has a meltdown and slams her her um, racket her, against the, racket. the court. Yeah. That's something that I, I've seen penalized before. So she loses a point. Melts down, calls him a thief, goes on for minutes demanding an apology from him. It was getting uncomfortable as she was just berating this guy with a mic on, with the crowd behind her, um, and was just berating this umpire to the point where 
I'd have kicked her out myself. And the controversy over whether she should have gotten a game taken away at, at that point or not, in my mind, as I said, it, it was just an ugly, ugly scene that he had every right to pull from her. Now, whether they do it for others, whether her claim that men get away with saying worse, well, maybe they shouldn't. But again, you know, it, it, you did something that was unethical. You did something that was was very poor. And trying to make your case by stating, oh, well, others do worse, is just ridiculous. It's, it's politics uh, 101 is what it is, where your candidate may be doing illegal things, but the other guy that was there before was even worse. You know, it's a hell of a way to justify something. Personally, I think he was very justified in doing exactly what he did for her. And the thing that I was offended was she comes out and claims that she was doing it for the equality of women. Of course. For what? So they can go around and, and uh, say and be as ignorant to an uh, umpire as the men are? I, I mean, I, I thought that was about the biggest piece of horse shit I've ever heard come out of an athlete's mouth. I was doing it for the betterment of women. What was she doing for the betterment of women? I don't understand. But I'm a Serena fan. I love watching her. I love when she wins. I've always been a fan. But in this case, um, and uh, there was a case earlier where I believe she uh, told an umpire she would kill him, um, she is out of line, and she deserved what she got. I don't know if you guys had a chance to see any of that. No, I, I think you're right, Dave. Yep. I mean, I, I think you hit it right on the head with that one. Um you know, it, in our society, we have a lot of, yeah, but what about ism going on, you know? So, okay. you know, stand up, say, I was wrong, move on. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, I think you discredit the victor, too. I mean, I think the thing that's always... Well, but, she, but here's the thing. She was she was very gracious, too. I mean, that, that and you're right. It was, it was her first, um, you know, major title, and in many ways... A lot of the story is what happened, you know. With, with and Serena. it was the first one for a major tournament for a, a woman from Japan, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so. Probably, a, I don't remember a, a male uh, Japanese tennis player winning, so it could have been the first one yeah. Japanese player to win a major. Probably, yeah, probably. Yeah. You know, she was I, gracious, I, but she also caused the problem. Well, that's my point. I mean, it's easy, you know, then I think when you realize that, you know, tennis is a small business, kind of like boxing is. It's a small circle. You know, it's gotten more so that way. And I think when she probably realized that the media was going to have a lot of negative things to say, there was probably a groundswell around it. Then I think she was gracious. I, I mean, it's hard, you can't take away the woman's accomplishments or even the, her and the sister's accomplishments. But I don't know, Dave, I, I've never been a fan. I think when things are going their way, then they're great. They're gracious. When things aren't going their way, they have a tendency to do exactly what she did yesterday. Yeah, I agree. And the whole sport, like golf and even boxing, individual sports, you know, have a lot of prima donnas. But I don't know. They, they, they've rubbed me the wrong way from the very beginning. They always thought the rules didn't apply to them. They, when they, when the rules, the same rules are applied to them, they complained about it. And I think she behaved completely in character. You know, so um, I'm glad she got dumped. You know, and I think that I'm glad that one of the referees didn't worry about whatever their Nike fueled empire is, and basically said, "Look, you're not supposed to do this, and you're not supposed to do that, so you're losing a, you're losing a game in the set. Too bad." You know, I mean, I think to me, I was thrilled to see it. Honestly, I didn't watch it, but I was thrilled with the outcome of it. I mean, that's not to take away from the accomplishments. I mean, the accomplishments are staggering. Well, and, but, and that's why I I love yeah. I, I love watching talent. I mean, you know, people I mean, there's no question. against Tiger Williams or Tiger um, right. Woods. I love watching Tiger Woods when he's at his best. I love watching Serena Williams when she's there because she's beautiful to watch. Um, Fletch, you were you were saying something earlier? Well, I mean, I think um, it's interesting. In the same day, I don't know if you caught you guys caught or if you have it. If you caught the fight on Showtime, the Sean Porter Danny Garcia. Fight. Now, Garcia's father is a, is a royal jackass. He's from Philadelphia. He's completely obnoxious. He's not somebody you'd probably want to spend two minutes around. But the, the kid, Garcia the fighter, has been a pretty good fighter most of his career. And I, I honestly thought you could have given him the nod in the decision over Sean Porter. Mm-hmm. But at the end of the fight, he had to write he, – he could have pulled a Serena Williams. He didn't. He went the other way. 
he basically said, look, you know, I thought I did enough to win, but the judge just called the way he did. I hope I get another opportunity, and I'll see him down the road. You know, I mean, he didn't sit there and carp about everything that went against him and then turn around after the fact. So, you know, I think in the same day, it's interesting, you know, one four o'clock and one eleven o'clock, basically the same situation. Yeah. You know, I thought that uh, there's there's some things that could happen in the bout that, you know, Garcia could have been, you know, given or Porter could have been deducted a point or whatever, but it went the opposite way. So, um I don't know. I mean, you know, tennis tennis is a, a business that uh, is not getting the attention it used to, and it's a shame because that's kind of, that's the attention you don't want on it. It's still a very good game, but nobody seems to watch it anymore because you can't find it. You, know, you can't find it unless it's one of the big four tournaments or you have the tennis channel. So it's a shame from that standpoint, too. That's not the kind of press I think the sport needed, you know. No. So, although I, I truly think. Uh, as any sport, if it was bigger in this country and it's not, it would probably get better press as it did in the 80s. I think that's probably one of the yeah. biggest challenges with tennis is it just doesn't have yep. uh, there's not enough good players in this country to, to follow. That's what uh, McEnroe's been saying for a long time and he's probably right about that. Pretty well yep. spot on. And yep. I'm sorry, Fletch, you were saying too? Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm ready to, to, to give my bold prediction, boys. I'm ready to bring <laughs> it on home. Here's for the end, Fletch. Because you're going to bring right. us home with a, a great prediction, I, I attempt. And to humiliate Gary, since he was gone for two weeks, <laughs> this is the most uncomfortable thing for him. I'm going to make him first. Well, Gary's going to lash out at us and because of that. He's going to pull Serena Williams on us right now. Oh, I, my God. Because I really don't going to call me that. a thief. No, I I'm really don't. Have to apologize to him. <laughs> Only uncomfortable because I'm not real good about predicting tomorrow, much less... <laughs> something that's coming up, and uh, I really don't know that much either, as you guys are probably starting to figure Come out. on, man. It's football season. Blow us away, man. <laughs> I haven't really looked at the upcoming football schedule, so I'm going to go to what I know. Uh, you know, it's uh, the, 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 the fight this coming Saturday is a big one. There aren't that many big right. ones, but uh, the Gennady Golovkin, uh, Canelo Alvarez fight is a big one. Uh, How many think... syllables? <laughs> <laughs> the... Uh, you got to give me some credit for pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> Very <laughs> most of the time. I am. You didn't have to buy a vowel. That's the, yeah, that I was the most impressive That's part. I did not. You know, if you're going to watch boxing these days, you better learn how to pronounce Eastern Europe and South American names. But, <laughs> um, but the the you know the first fight was a very good one. It had quite a bit of controversy in it. Uh, you know, a lot of people thought Golovkin won easily. I didn't think he won easily, but I did think he won. And then, of course, we had the problem with. The Mexican fighter, Canelo Alvarez, got tested twice for PEDs, which he says because he ate bad meat in Mexico. People have a lot of skepticism oh. about that. So a lot of his legacy is on the line. He's been a pretty good fighter. You know, 41 you for Joe for years. years. It, it does work, Gary. What's that? Eating Mexican meat. I've used that excuse for years. Well, I just yeah. well you know, if you're eating Mexican meat, uh, Dave, keep doing <laughs> it. Cause it'll give you plenty of <laughs> testosterone, apparently. So, um, you know, you, you, uh, you'll be able to endure for longer. Ten minutes. Oh, man. Um, the, 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 I think the prediction I have for the fight is I think it's going to be easier for Golovkin the second time, which is not that bold. But usually in boxing, the rematch goes to the guy who won it the first time, and it goes easier. I don't know if he's going to knock him out, but I think he's going to win a more decisive victory over Alvarez this coming weekend. So that's my bold prediction. All right. All right. Well, my, my bold prediction, um, and I'm going to be looking for that one, because I, I read, that was the cover on Ring Magazine this uh, yes, it was. month was that fight. So I'm yep. going to be looking forward to that. Now, it's mine is this. Now, I, you, if you want it live, but it's this one might be worth it. It's pretty good undercard under it as well. So yeah, cool, very cool. Yep. Well, I was wrong earlier as I'm looking at the pit schedule. They play North Carolina and Syracuse in between UCF and, and Notre Dame, so they won't be one and four. But I will make the bold prediction: if Pat Narduzzi does not beat Georgia Tech, looking at the schedule, he is out of a job at the end of the year. Boom. Wow. End of story. Wow. Good prediction. Mr. Fletcher, bring us home. Well, guys, before our conversation today, I had the Steelers coming in at 10 and 6 for the year. Well, now it looks like it's going to be maybe 9, 6, and 1. And they're going to be looking for a tiebreaker to get into the postseason tournament, I think. You know, they escaped, I said earlier, they escaped a lot of close games last year, but I don't see it happening again. You know, I do like the D-line. Uh, you know, a key is going to be Bud Dupree. 
you will know, switch of sides make a difference for him. And, you know, we saw a, a really impressive J.J. Watt today. But, you know, for for a lot of reasons, uh, Joe Hayden's health, is the depth of the O-line is going to be a challenge. So uh, I think that, there, that you know, people were, are, were really excited about the window going into this year. You know, if, if they get into the playoffs, who knows what, what's going to happen. But, you know, guys, I'm, I'm not feeling like it's, they're going to be like a 12-4 and four team that people were talking about. So that's my bold prediction. Well, that would be a shame because the window is closing quickly. There were some things today that, if you watched it today closely, Fletch, I, I would tend to agree with you. There's clearly some weaknesses beyond just the things you mentioned. The, you know, they they they, they 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 didn't look awful today, but they didn't look like a dominant team either. No, no, no. I, I was just happy with the way the defense um, yeah. came out, and and you know, giving up six turnovers, some in bad bad situations. Yeah. I I. I but I can see Fletch's. I mean, his point is pretty much spot on. That was a yep. lot of, a lot of games that they pulled out of their ass last year. That yep. uh, you know, you don't always do two years in a row. So, unfortunately, you may be, you may be uh, on the spot there, my friend. Yep. Can, can I leave us with one positive note, though? Please. The Washington Wild Things will win their first Frontier League championship this week. <laughs> Aaron Heed. There you Aaron go. Aaron Heed. Okay, I'll have another pennant going up in the room downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Uh, all right, gentlemen, I want you to go home and watch <laughs> Deliverance. <laughs> and, uh, you know, try not to squeal like a pig. <laughs> I will I will do my best, David. <laughs> all right. We will, Pleasure uh, as always. We will talk again next week. <laughs> all right. All right. Goodbye. Bye. This has been a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production.